everyone, and welcome back. I promised myself at the beginning of this year that I would spend a lot more time focusing on photography, actually getting photographs and enjoying time with the things that I've made rather than just focusing on the process alone. And I have long admired the photography styles of both Liza Roberts and Julie Floro. They do amazing fantasy photography, and I have really wanted to work with them for a while, but they're both on the East Coast. Well, thankfully, one of the retreats that Liza organized happened to be on the coast of Oregon, which is a pretty easy flight for me to get up to Portland, so I finally was was able to jump on that chance and get to do one of their photography retreats. Now, the way that these work can be in a variety of different styles. Some of the events that Liza organizes are single events, one night, one event. Others are more workshop-based where you get to go and learn about how to do some of the photography yourself. In this case, this one is a much larger event and very, very in-depth. So it took place over really four days overall. There were two days that were the major photography days and then two travel days on either end of it. And a good sized group of us, it ended up being nine in total, went out to the coast of Oregon, stayed in an Airbnb together and did four different photo shoots over the process of those two days. The themes for these vary from retreat to retreat for obvious reasons, depending on where they are, certain themes are a lot easier than other locations. Because we were on the coast that opened up a wide range of options, so we had seaside romanticism, which was a bit more of a Victorian seaside feel. We also did a pirate themed photo shoot as well as a wood elf style, very high elf fancy stylings, but in the deep dark woods, as well as nymphs. And between these four different shoots, we ended up with four dramatically different styles, which meant four dramatically different costumes needed to be prepared for these, accessorized, props brought along with all of the different things. So it is a really big event and a little bit overwhelming. So I thought it'd be great today for me to talk about what went on for the entire process to sort of give you an opportunity to understand how much goes into these sorts of events. If you are considering doing something like this yourself, this will really help you understand what to be prepared for and what to expect and how the process works. But even if you simply want to go out and do photography like this with a group of friends. They should also help just the whole range of inspiration that you can get for how these sorts of things can work because they are incredible incredibly complex. Doing four major photo shoots where you have to drive to different locations, hike through the forest, walk along the beach, through the sand, it's a lot of physical work and pretty exhausting. And I am so impressed at how our little group came together and everyone <laughs> managed everything. So I'm really excited to share with you not only the prep stuff, but a whole bunch of behind the scenes stuff and some preview photographs. There'll be a lot more of the photographs coming not only on my Instagram, but the Instagrams of everyone involved in the project. I've linked everyone's Instagram below in the description. So please go check out every single participant. They were all so much fun to work with and such amazing people. Definitely go take a look. But in the end, it was about three incredibly magical days, and I am just returned from it absolutely exhausted and pretty much got home and crashed hard in bed, which thankfully for me, the sponsor for this week's video is Birch Mattress. If you've ever experienced a bad night or week on a hotel mattress, you know how fast everything unravels, and I don't want to put my guests through that. That's why I am so happy to introduce Birch. They make mattresses and sleep products that are stylish, comfortable, and environmentally conscious. And they've got some exciting flash sales going on this month, so it's a great time to upgrade your mattress. Not only do they offer the simplicity of having a premium mattress delivered to your door, but they understand the importance of materials. Their mattresses are crafted with organic and natural materials that have been sustainably sourced, assembled in a GOTS certified Arizona facility. And they're free from polyurethane foams and fiberglass, so no off-gassing or irritants. The Birch Lux Natural Mattress even includes eight different layers of organic cashmere, New Zealand wool, fair trade cotton, and 100% natural latex. And by having wool in these mattresses, it makes them both allergy and mildew resistant. I've been sleeping on my Birch Lux mattress for about two years now and it has made such a difference. I thought it was normal to wake up tired and sore with back and joint aches, but I can honestly say that with my Birch mattress, I sleep through the night and wake up without pain. And now my guest room has a bed as comfortable as my own, which since this is my office, I am definitely going to be taking advantage of that. And you don't have to worry about trying it out. With your Birch mattress, you get a 100 night sleep trial along with a 25 year warranty. That means you'll get more than three months to make sure that you love it. The best part about all of this is that Birch delivers your mattress right to your door 
door for free within the US. They also offer in-home setup and removal to make your buying experience as convenient as possible. I love my Birch mattress and I think you would too. If you're looking for a new bed, check out Birch Living. Visit birchliving.com slash Nicole Rudolph to get 20% off a Birch mattress plus two free eco rest pillows. For your little ones, check out the Birch Kids Natural Mattress, which is a 2023 Good Housekeeping Parenting Award winner. Thanks again to Birch Mattress for sponsoring this week's video and <laughs> giving me the much needed rest that I needed after this absolutely insane last few weeks because there was so much prep work to go into this. When I first signed up for this project back in the spring, we started with a whole lot of planning from the beginning. Both Liza and Julie started communicating with the group early on as to what the expectations would be, what the themes would be. We started a Discord, so that way everything would be laid out for each individual shoot, talking about who needs rides, who needs picked up where, what needs to happen with all of the different organization. We ended up with Pinterest boards that were given to us for all four of the shoots, so that way we knew what sort of color schemes and styles we were looking for, because it's really hard to coordinate a group that large into looking cohesive, but not all exactly the same. That was definitely a concern of mine that I should not have had because honestly, everyone looked so unique, but it all worked together perfectly. And I am still absolutely in awe at how that managed. I personally came into it knowing that I wanted to make a fair deal of this because that is my background. That's what I like to do. I also knew that I really didn't have much in my closet to handle most of this. In the case of pirates, I definitely did. I have a lot of 18th century stuff. I've made pirate clothing before. So I knew that I'd likely be able to pull from that. So I started off by designing all four of these different styles and Pirates was the one that I left to last. So just in case I didn't have a chance to make anything, which uh, spoiler alert, I didn't have the chance to make anything for it, I'd still be okay. The one that I started with though was the one that I was most excited for, which was the elves. I have always wanted to do a wide variety of elf costumes, but I've never really had an excuse to do so. The first thing I did was look at the board, which showed jewel tones, really rich golds and silvers, anything that was very elevated and fancy. So I first pulled out all the different fabrics that I had as possibilities to see what inspired me. The one that I kept coming back to was this pleated fabric. It's a polyester, which is actually perfect because for once, I don't need this to be historically accurate. And a lot of these photo shoots are going to be on the beach or in a forest with lots of moss and trees and things like that. So I do not expect any of this to come out pristine. And in fact, it's better if I'm able to actually wash it or get it dirty and not be concerned about it. So I didn't want to wear something really nice for any of these photo shoots, but I did still want it to look nice. I wanted it to have texture. So this pleated fabric was absolutely perfect. It really reminds me of the Fortuny pleats. So I ended up deciding on the long sleeve style of that. It's basically just a tube with some slightly shaped sleeves on the ends. There's very little shaping here, very few curves. It's all meant to be really simple. So that way I don't have to actually do that much to the fabric. The pleats were on the horizontal. So thankfully the length that I needed for the gown was about the width of the fabric. I just cut it to be that. I didn't finish really anything on the inside, to be honest. I just let it go because this is not meant to be a long-term wear over and over thing. I did finish off the edges with ribbons so they wouldn't fray and my mother was very kind in helping me by stitching on little beads along the top edge to hold together the sleeves and the neckline, much like the Fortuny styles. So that was the base garment that I had for this. I did have to leave slits on the side rather than having the super long puddle at the bottom because the fabric in reality wasn't quite as full as Fortuny pleats are. So I wasn't able to walk when I closed it up completely down to the seams, which worked out fine because this is also the outfit where I chose to do the leaf shoes for it in the previous video. So you will be finally seeing a whole ensemble and photo shoot with those coming up very shortly. But I also knew that this wasn't as much as I wanted. I decided to tie a gold rope around the waist in order to give a little bit more shape to the garment, but I needed more impact. And so I decided on a velvet cloak. I went through a lot of different fabrics in my collection and nothing quite worked. Everything was either a little bit too dull, a little bit too flat or wasn't quite the right color. So I did end up having to order some silk velvet for this which came in at the very last second because I went back and forth over making that decision for far too long. So the cape that I made for this ended up being incredibly simple. And I am really proud of this design. I didn't cut into the fabric at all. I had 
three yards and I didn't want to do any more work than I had to. So the way that it's done is the two ends, the raw ends of the fabric come up to the front of the shoulders and get gathered. Then along the one selvage edge, it loops down under the arms, comes back up and becomes the backside of the shoulder seams. Then it drops way down in the back where I tacked it together into a V so that way it wouldn't just fall off my shoulders. And I ended up with a cape style that gave me a train as well as the gathered up loop under the arms that I wanted. And all I had to do was very quickly stitch back the two long selvage edges and deal with the shoulder seams. And that was it. I added a couple of accents to the sleeves with a few antique gold acorns that I stitched onto some cords just for a little bit of extra. But it was a very, very quick thing. It only took me a few hours to put this together. For my head, I ended up going with a wig because my hair is not very elven. And I got a crown from Gardens of Whimsy that matched with the color tone that I was going for. That way I didn't have to make something from scratch because I've never made anything like that before. And it didn't seem like the right time to start with the amount of scheduling I had. Next up, I started on the seaside romanticism. Though a lot of people ended up going with more Edwardian styling, which was a lot easier to put together thrifted versions of. I was compelled, I think mostly due to Thistle Thistle, to make an 1830s, 1840s style of gown. I've done this era before, but only with the really giant sleeves. And I thought that a really light frothy version of this would look absolutely gorgeous. So I went through a few different designs for sleeves and bodices, how I could put something over it. So that way it wasn't just all white. And after going through my collection, realizing I don't have much in the way of sheer cottons or silks that I'm willing to put into the ocean for that matter, I ended up getting a really lightweight ivory cotton and a sort of sage green version of it as well, and a cheaper dupioni silk to go underneath of that. I originally wanted to do this as the main dress in ivory and a pinafore dress style over it, which is what I did end up making. I based this off of the 1830s patterns that I had done previously, so that way I wouldn't have to start completely from scratch. They are very off the shoulder, which looked beautiful. If I did something like this again, I'd probably rein it in just a little bit. This is not the most practical thing to wear, even though it is really pretty to look at. I did also do the more tightly fitted 1840s sleeves, so that way everything's gathered in at the top, which I really like the look of, but I did realize with the way off the shoulder style and the way that everything fits there, I have almost no mobility in this gown. <laughs> so kind of something to consider uh, matching up two different eras with slightly different styles. And part of the problem I had when I went to make the pinafore version to go over is that I wanted it to be sleeveless, but it needed to match the bodice style. So I did that and it works. It does need to have the shoulders pinned together in order to not just fall off. But I really honestly felt something about it just read incredibly youthful and it wasn't quite right for what I was wanting for this shoot or for me. And so all I did was simply tuck the bodice down inside of the rest of the gown and put it around my waist that way. So it just looks like an overskirt. I may or may not remove the bodice in the future. I'm still not sure about it. I'm not completely convinced it was the wrong idea, but I'm not really convinced it was the right one either. Point is, those were made up very quickly based off of patterns that I already had. And the accessories were just pulling a whole bunch of random things from my collection. I had a belt buckle that I picked up for 1860s many years prior. The necklace is actually the one that I purchased for Maleficent. And I did have to wear a wig for this one as well, but it actually worked out perfectly because this was the first photo shoot of the four, the first day. And that way I knew that I didn't have to get up super early and try to figure out how to make my hair into something that felt historical. I am going to be putting up a much more in-depth version of making this gown as well as the pattern on my Patreon. If you want to go check that out, that will be for the extras group and up. I just realized there's not enough time to cram all of the making of details into this video because there's so much stuff because in addition to those two things, the third outfit was the nymph outfit. I definitely didn't have anything appropriate for that, but thankfully it is very, very simple. <laughs> this is much like the elf base dress, just a tube, which I made out of a less expensive, what they call spun silk. So thankfully it's just thick enough that it's not see-through, which was kind of important when I wasn't planning on wearing much underneath of this and it has sleeves attached. The only difference was this time I just did triangular sleeves. So that way it had the really long points coming off and I simply sort of pleated them up to make sure that they weren't too long, got them just above my elbows and put a straight pin in. 
and that was how I created that shape. Though admittedly the event was pretty chilly in terms of the weather for the weekend, so I did make some adjustments and made sure that I had a pair of wool bike shorts underneath that was roughly skin toned, and I'm very grateful that I did that, so highly recommend layers underneath if you can. For bringing in the body, I used the same gold rope that I had for the elves and wrapped that around in a semi-Grecian, vaguely classical style. It's more based off of the artistic portraiture of the 19th century than it is actual classical fashion, but I just thought it was a really appropriate way of doing that. For my hair for that, I had absolutely no idea what I was going to do and just simply shoved a whole bunch of nicely curled hair pieces into a bag and really hoped I'd figure something out the day of, which I did. Thankfully, I had also brought this sash for the pirates, which I'll talk about next, and I simply put in a whole bunch of hair pieces on the back of my head, wrapped the sash around in a semi-classical way in order to cover up where all of the seams and changes took place, and then shoved a whole bunch of paper flowers into my hair in the back. It looks like it's straight out of the Fantasia movie, and I am immensely pleased with how it turned out, considering I was just doing this first thing in the morning and had no clue if it was going to work or not. <laughs> I was looking for accessory options in my collection for this one and just wasn't finding anything that worked for the neck area, jewelry just wasn't making sense, and I came across this little embroidery collar that I have that's from probably around the turn of the 20th century. It was the perfect colors, the perfect style, but it felt a little weird wearing it as a collar and it honestly barely fits my neck. It is really, really tiny and I didn't want to stress the piece and I thought you know, it'd be really lovely to have something a little more flowy and cape-like. So I pulled some silk chiffon out of my stash in the changeable style. It's gold and silver to match with everything and simply tacked it to the ends of the collar, which I sort of wore as an open style in the front instead. And it worked out absolutely perfectly. It was so quick to make up, but it really has the beautiful movement. It catches the light in all the right ways. The last photo shoot to plan for, like I said, was the pirates. I did come up with designs, beautiful coat ideas, but I knew I probably wasn't going to get to them and I was correct. I had also wanted to make a pair of breeches for this that I could then use for an upcoming event, but that was definitely also not happening. So instead I realized I don't have breeches that fit the pair that I made a couple years ago. It's just a little too tight and it's silk. It's not the best thing to be climbing around on rocks with. So I just bought a pair of wool leggings. Wool knit was popular fabric for breeches in the late 18th century, so it's not completely outside of the historical realm of things, just not so much accurate. And over that I used the white 18th century shirt that I made a few years back, the pirate waistcoat that I made last year, used a sash that I had from a Regency event more than a decade ago, and a whole bunch of other little accessories and pieces that I've collected over the years. And the hat in the end was the absolute perfect choice. It's actually my 1780s riding habit hat, but at this point it has been worn and rained on so much that it's really soft and squishy, uh, which actually worked out perfectly because not only does it give a good effect for a pirate, but it meant that I could shove it into my luggage and not have to worry about damaging it. So <laughs> that was great. The only problem that I had was I didn't have any boots or anything that would be appropriate. I knew that I was going to be walking into the ocean and climbing around on rocks and things like that. And there was no time for me to make anything. So I ended up buying a pair of modern boots. I looked for something that didn't have a zipper very intentionally because uh, as everyone found out, when you walk into the ocean, that is a leak point very, very quickly. But that ended up being all of the bits and pieces that I needed for these four outfits. So I made a few things, I pulled a lot of stuff, I finally got to use a lot of strange accessories and bits and pieces that I don't normally get to pull out, and ended up with a really wide variety of outfits. This was not necessarily the way that everyone else did it. Some of the things you're going to see were made, some of the things were thrifted or assembled in different ways. There's everything from someone's wedding gown to things being fully made by hand to literally just taking fabric and wrapping it around the day of. But everything came together incredibly well, no matter what the source material was. Both Julie and Liza were incredibly helpful and walked us through what we needed to do, making sure that our hair was positioned correctly, that our hands were in a good place, chin was in the right place, you know, look, not looking at a weird angle. And there were a variety of different types of shoots, every single one. There were a few full group shops, a few 
smaller group shots, and then individual portraits as well. So everyone got a chance to do things in different ways, in different areas. There were lots of us that did some strange things, climbing on rocks, walking into the ocean, climbing up on tree stumps, or laying down the ground, but that was always an option. It was who is okay with kneeling, because sometimes you couldn't in your costume when you could the day before. So everything was very carefully planned out. We did, like I said, two shoots each day, one in the morning and one in the afternoon to evening, depending on where we needed the sun for the events. So we ended with four very different styles and looks, even though they actually were really only two locations. So the first location that we used was the beach that was really close to where we were staying and had the perfect misty morning for the seaside romanticism and had the late night golden hour and sunset for pirates. The next day we had the misty, beautiful rays of light coming through the forest first thing in the morning for the nymphs. And then we actually ended up returning to the same forest and finding different areas for the elves later that day which uh, is an adventure unto itself because that was not the original plan. We had to change our plans a few times throughout the weekend for where we were going, just because as tides came in and out, some areas were accessible or not. We went to one little island and area for the pirates to begin with and found out that there was about a six foot river running through it at that time of the day and you couldn't actually get to the side of the island that we wanted to. So we ended up having to change our plans pretty quickly on that still turned out honestly probably even better than it would have in the original location and um, as you'll see when it comes to the elves shoot we had a completely different location in mind that was in one of the local forests nearby. The Google reviews for the park showed absolutely beautiful photographs. It looked like there was a great location that was only going to be about a 45 minute drive. This was the bigger one of the day. The rest had only been about 15 minutes or literally walking distance. And so we were going to drive to what looked like a gorgeous area deep in the dark forest nearby and it ended up being a little bit different as you will see. But all in all, it came out absolutely beautiful. Everyone did such an amazing job. And if you ever do get a chance to do this sort of photography retreat, I highly recommend it. Everyone was coming in from different angles, whether it's a fantasy background, cosplay, costumes, or just really wanting to get out there and do something fun that they hadn't tried before. They really can be for absolutely everyone. And again, I have to just say how much I absolutely adore the work that both Liza and Julie have done. They worked so hard to get this organized. And for the other participants in the photo shoot how absolutely amazing everyone's work was and how wonderful they were to spend the weekend with.
we accidentally went up a logging road that was labeled as a trail head. Um, and so we're now having to back the cars down to turn them around because uh, we had a spot where there was a lock across the road and we're up a mountain. Um, and it's, give me a second, it's gotten interesting. So this is where we are. This is, <laughs> this is what we're doing. <laughs> Backing back down to where we can turn around. We're almost there. <laughs> <laughs>